want to do is just jump in and tell you a little bit about augmentative communication. In our session, we, we decided there were three things that we'd really like you to get out of this session. The first one is to just understand some of the basic concepts or principles of augmentative communication, and we'll do that with, uh, with a slideshow. And then the second one is to make sure that you're aware of a couple of resources where people can go to get more service or information when it comes to augmentative communication. And then our final objective is just to help you become aware of some of the products that we are using with clients on a regular basis. So first of all, what is augmentative and alternative communication? So augment basically means to, to increase a current capacity, to add to something that they already have. So when we're talking about augmentative and alternative communication, it's any device, system, or method that improves the communication skills of an individual with a communication impairment. The goal is to build on what they already have. And almost everyone, even those clients that we see who are quite severe in their limitations, have at least some communication intent or ability. So these are all of the things that could be considered as part of augmentative and alternative communication. Sign language. It could be a communication book, voice output, uh, communication devices, pointing or gesturing can help increase communication or indicate an interest or something that you might want. Um, and then things like laughing and crying, they also communicate something. Sometimes that cry might be discomfort, displeasure, or unhappiness. But a smile is pretty universal communication, even if we're in another country. We know that a smile communicates happiness Writing can be a form of augmentative communication. We, we see occasionally um, in uh, an accident situation where somebody has temporarily lost their voice, they might go right to a notepad with paper and pencil, and there they are, augmenting, augmenting or providing some alternative communication. And years ago, there was a feeling that there were prerequisites for someone who was uh, who is severely limited in their communication skills, that they had to have an understanding of cause and effect, that they had to recognize that they were actually communicating. But now, experts in the field of augmentative <coughs> communication say that, that there are really no prerequisites. At no matter what level an individual is at, if we can give them an individualized, customized approach that we can help increase their communication in some respect. And who can conduct a, an augmentative evaluation? Scott and I at, at UCAD, as we work there, we do what we call an individual consultation, which is a little different from an evaluation. An augmentative communication evaluation should be conducted with the help of a speech language pathologist. Oftentimes there are other experts, technology specialists, or motor specialists such as an OT or a PT that should also be involved. And the motor specialists are especially important if there are some seating and positioning issues because we don't want to put the individual in a position where now they can talk but we're ruining their posture or we're, we're contributing to scoliosis or some other problem. So we don't want to do anything like that. So we want to make sure that, that we're enhancing their communication, but we also want to ensure that we're keeping that individual healthy. But one of the reasons that the, the speech pathologist is so critical is because in many funding sources, they require a written recommendation from a speech language pathologist. And, and that's part of the importance. If the funding is going to be provided through independent living or vocational rehabilitation, they're not always quite um, as necessary as far as the, the speech path 
report. One of the concerns that we occasionally get from parents, especially if they, they have children who they are hopeful that they'll continue to develop some oral language skills, is they say, well, we don't want to give them a crutch and have them use a communication board because that will reduce their need to develop oral language. But all of the research now indicates that augmentative communication devices actually help promote oral language development. So that is, uh, that has become kind of an invalid concern and we try to share the research and information with the, the families. And so at the same time that we're looking at augmentative communication, we also want to continue to develop verbal skills and literacy skills. That's why a lot of times on our communication devices, even though they need the picture or the symbol to select a message, we'll still put the word or phrase to accompany that and continue to develop those academic uh, literacy skills as they go along. Two places where you can learn about or get additional services in the area of augmentative communication. The UAC teams. Through the State Office of Education, every school district, including charter schools, now have access to augmentative communication services. One of the benefits to this service is that the evaluation can actually take place in the student's school. So it's in, their, in an environment that they're familiar with and comfortable with. So if you have any school age clients, all of them would be eligible for an evaluation by the UAC teams in the schools. The second source, UCAT, Scott and I, we will work with any age and anyone within the state of Utah. So there's, there's no requirement other than the fact that they have a disability, then they, they can be referred to us and we are happy to do, as, as I said, those cost-free consultation sessions where we let people try things out for an hour or two hours, whatever it takes during their visit to UCAT and then we try to send them away for a one month time period with the device that looks the most promising from our experience during the consultation session. So they, they really get some hands-on experience at UCAT as well as hopefully some trial experience in their home environment, in their own school or um, out in the community. And that is one of the things that we feel is a strength to both of these programs is that in both cases, the UAC teams and the visitors to UCAT have access to equipment through 30-day lending libraries. And that is one of the critical um, features to a successful selection of an augmentative communication device is that they have some time to use it. And we try, when we do our consultation, Scott and I try to not be prescriptive. What I mean by that is we want to be very client-centered. We want them to, to inform us as to which of those devices that we've tried today, what do you think would be the most helpful to you? And in some cases, if they're very young, then we're, we're going to use the parents' wisdom and have them kind of make a selection. And you know, a lot of times they'll say, well, what do you think? What do you think we should try? And we'll say, well, this, this and this maybe looked good, but maybe what you ought to do is try this one for a month, bring that back, and then try the other one for a month after that. So there's no limit. We had one gentleman with, uh, with ALS, was newly diagnosed with ALS. I think he came in four months in a row and tried different things and he really had a good, um, good feel for what was going to help him because he was willing to, to invest the, the time and the investigation to use those devices. But for the UAC teams, www.uac.org, and we have listed for every school district the team leader at our website so that a referral can be submitted or a call can be made to the team leader and get them started with that evaluation process. In the UACT equipment, which we have 
um, ongoing funding. Every year there has been funds through the State Office of Education to add to that lending library. It is a very up-to-date um, library with some of the very finest augmentative communication devices. Our UCAT library is not quite as up-to-date as many of you know. We try to keep it up-to-date, but it's not quite as current as the UACT library. Okay, and now some of the considerations that we look at. A lot of times we, we consider whether or not the individual is able to read. If they're not yet able to read, then generally speaking, we're going to look at a symbol-based or a picture-based communication device, one that, that's going to have pictures. So here, here are a couple of good examples of, of symbol-based communication overlays that, that might be used. Even with those, we do try to put the, the text or the words with those symbols. And when we do that, we need to determine how many symbols and how big of a symbol do they need? So for accuracy, if an individual's pointing with, with their finger, we need to look at how big of a symbol do they need in order for them to accurately make a selection. Or we may need to look at the number of symbols that they can handle and how many messages do they really need. Now we've seen people with three or four messages be able to function fairly independently uh, if the messages are just the ones that they need. Sometimes we're looking at what can they reach. If they have limited motor skills, what we'll do is we'll put the critical messages in the easiest to reach locations. And then the messages that aren't as important could be out on the peripheral or the sides or corners of that device. As we look at the access method, we might look at the direct selection options, uh, again pointing, but there's a lot of mouse options that can be considered or head pointers. The head mouse, which is, has been a great tool for selection in augmentative communication. Um, if the individual can't use the direct selection methods, then we'll try to find some type of a switch that they can bump. Maybe they can press it with their finger, bump it with an elbow, hit it with their cheek. We want to make sure that the vocabulary is appropriate for the environment. So sometimes what we might do is make a paper overlay that we'll place in the kitchen that might have some food selections and a different paper overlay that might be in the bathroom so they can say, well, I need toothpaste or washcloth or uh, help me find my toothbrush or something like that. So as we look at those environments, we look at the messages that they need over all the environments through their day. We also want to look at the level of support that they might have. We see as individuals transition from one setting to another, for example, a student who's graduating from, from high school and going into a post-secondary program or, or maybe into supported employment, well, in the high school setting, they had a speech pathologist who was available to help them once a week, one-on-one -on -one for an hour, and help program and adapt their device. Well, if they lose that, that level of support, then as they make that transition, a simpler communication system may be more helpful. The other thing we look at is, is the individual ambulatory? Are they able to walk? And if so, do they have the strength to carry a device? But this is a heavy device. If we've got a six-year-old child, maybe with cerebral palsy and very limited um, abilities as far as they can walk, but maybe they've got to have a walker or they, you know, if they had this hanging down over their neck, it'd pull them right over. So size is often a critical decision or, or an important factor when making a decision on the device. Um, another thing that we look at is core vocabulary versus a program device. Many communication devices now come with, a, with what is called a core vocabulary. And what we mean by that is it might have storage for 500 words. But 
as the user learns to find those 500 words, they can combine them and make phrases and say virtually anything they want. And the core vocabulary devices often come with years and years of research by speech pathologists who have determined what words are critical for the success of clients. So if we can, if we can get the support for someone to learn the core vocabulary, that in the long run could be much more effective communication than having a, pro a program device where we select all of the vocabulary but give them instant access to it. So we have to weigh those kinds of things to decide, well, do we want the core vocabulary or do they need that instant access to communication messages that are going to impact them right now? Um, and oftentimes what we'll do is combine the two so that, so that they have the best of both worlds. And updates are also a, a critical issue. Again, as we're, as we're working with individuals as they transition even in their curriculum let's say we've got a sixth grade student who maybe in in sixth grade they've been um, in their uh, social studies or health class they've been learning a specific thing let's say they're learning about the ear studying the ear and, and a little bit of, of physiology well if the vocabulary for that lesson isn't in their device how are they going to communicate to anyone that they understand or they know what's being talked about in the classroom. So it's necessary to update vocabulary on a regular basis. We wanted you to have a couple of very helpful websites that could support you as you uh, might need to do research or look up additional information on augmentative communication. Linda Burkhardt is a national expert in augmentative communication and she has some very practical, in many cases, low cost, no cost, um, ideas to support communication. We put our, our UAC website, newsletter articles are posted. We've got, for example, in recent uh, issues of our newsletter, we've posted the most uh, appropriate apps for augmentative communication, information on other websites and links, um, and then just a, a couple of others there that are they're really good. Uh, the one with, with pictures can also add some resources. So now we're just going to jump in and show you some of the products that we've brought with us today. I'm going to show you a few of them here real quick and then Scott's going to jump in and show you some as well. So the, the system that I've got up there right now is called Speaking Dynamically Pro. It's a software program that would run on virtually any laptop computer, a Mac or a PC. And it's programmed with uh, customized messages. So maybe after you've heard enough of me, you might choose this message. I am totally bored. <laughs> so as you can see, we can get recorded speech. And that, in some cases, is very motivating to the, to the user to have a human quality voice that's easy to understand. But we can also use. Um, the computer voice. I am really happy. Now I've got. A, I know some of these have. I'm sad when I have to eat oatmeal for breakfast. <laughs> I know some of these have uh, the computer voice. I'm content just sitting here eating bonbons. Okay, so that's a sample of the computer voice. So you can tell a little bit of the difference there. Speaking Dynamically Pro is a dynamic program in that you can change pages. So those buttons that have the little green space in the corner with an, uh, an arrow are going to take me to another page. Save. And at, now at this page, I've got a couple of other links. You can see Thanks. that we've got a link to go back to our emotions page, a link, link to go to our phone messages, back. a link to go to reading back. pages, but now we also have a keyboard, and if I wanted to, I could type a unique message. So in, in augmentative communication, in the stored messages, the individual is, is somewhat enhanced in their ability to communicate, but they're also limited in what we give them. If we can give them access to a keyboard and text-to-speech, then we've taken away that limitation, and they can say anything. 
So if I want to write good afternoon, Seven. I can G. go up to the G. Y. It does word prediction. I can select the word. Good. Now I want an A to start e. afternoon. A. Q afternoon is there. Afternoon. Now I can speak that message. Speak. Good afternoon. So anything can be spoken. Um, we can give quick access to instant messages that we know they're going to use over and over again, and then they can do the text-to-speech with the on-screen keyboard. Now, again, I mentioned that sometimes we'll have folks who can't physically use direct selection. They can't use a head mouse. They can't use a regular mouse. They can't use a keyboard. We worked with a young lady who had really good control of her tongue but not very good control of any other body part. Well, we set up this switch, and I'm going to show you exactly how we set this up for this young lady. So, I, first of all, I've got what's called a spec switch. It's a, it's a $42 switch from AbleNet. It has an eighth inch jack. Now, there's no place to plug this in to my computer, so I need a switch adapted mouse. So I plug the switch into the switch adapted mouse and all that's been done is that mouse has had soldered into it a little eighth inch jack from Radio Shack and so every time I push this button it's going to act like a left mouse click. And so that's, that's what this is doing. So I just plug this into my USB port and I should be ready to go. And the Speaking Dynamically Pro software has a feature where I can change the access mode. So I just get out of the use mode into my program or setup mode, and I change my access method to auto scan. And I can tell the computer how long I want it to stay on each scan cycle. In this case, one and a half seconds. And I'll say OK. Now, with the magic arm mount, I'm going to put the spec switch right next to my cheek. And then each time I push my tongue against my cheek, it will activate that button. Can you just kind of see what I'm doing here? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in the use mode now, and I'm going to use my tongue to write that same sentence, good afternoon. So I, th my first switch hit is going to be to select the row with the letter G. And I know it'll scan through three times before it stops. A. My second F. switch hit is to select D. the letter that I want. F. G. Now I'm going for good. I'm going to go two quick switch hits because good is the first word in that block. Good. Now I want an A. A. Afternoon is there. I missed it the first time. I wasn't quite fast enough, but I know it's going to come back for me. You can adjust the speed, right? We can adjust the speed. So if it's going too fast. Afternoon. Now I want to choose the speak button so it'll say the full sentence for me. Speak. Good afternoon. So it said that message. So even if I can only move one muscle in my body, I'm going to be able to find a way to communicate. Because with Speaking Dynamically Pro and, and some of these other high-end communication products, those scan modes give us access to the device. Well, what do you notice about that access? So there's one feature that is kind of undesirable we're waiting. We have to do a lot of waiting. It's slow. So we look at scanning last as far as access modes because there's so much waiting. But if that's, if that's the motor control that that individual has, it's still a great way to enhance their communication ability. And even with, with the one switch, you can see we could, we could pull up a new file, we can save a file, we can print. So just about everything that you might want to do on a computer can be done with a single switch access.
I heard someone mention earlier that all of this assistive technology is expensive, and certainly that is the case in most instances. But here's an example of a free program for augmentative communication. Dasher software is produced by a company over in the UK. The company is Inference. So if anybody wants this free software, you could do a Google search for Dasher software inference and you'd be able to find the download and you could have this software free. So the way this works is we've got all of the letters of the alphabet are kind of along the yellow, the right side of that yellow section of my screen. The way this works is you drive through the letters with the mouse cursor and as you do so it will place the text up in the text box. Some people get a little bit motion sick, feel like they're seasick as they see these letters <laughs> come flying. Another impor important component of Dasher software is this vertical line in the center of the screen. As I move my cursor to the left of the vertical line, the letters will go backwards. As I move them to the right of the vertical line, the letters come forward toward me. So I click, click once to get it started. And I'm just going to write, uh, it is a beautiful sunny day. So I'm going for the I. Do you all kind of see the I there in the center of my list of letters? And I see that the T is already coming up right after it. So it's doing word prediction to help enhance my, my speed. And then there's a space. The space is where the little, little square is in the white box. So now I've typed it. Do you, do you see how it is up here in my box, in my text box? Because I drove through those letters. Now we're going to do is, a, uh, and then I'm going after beautiful. It's already predicting beautiful. Do you see sunny coming up? Day is already there. The sentence is predicted for me because I've used that sentence before. Is a beautiful sunny day. And it reads that sentence. The first person I saw use this was a gentleman from up in Park City. He had ALS. He was using a head mouse. He was writing 35 words a minute. So it has the potential to be a very powerful communication tool. When we look at low-tech devices, one of the reasons we do so is because they're simple. A second reason we do so is because they're cheap. A third reason that we do so is because they're durable. They don't break. Anybody with an electronic device is going to have a day when somebody forgot to charge the device or where the battery's just totally dead or maybe they're going to the beach and there's sand and water. And who wants an electronic device in sand and water? So uh, a printed communication page or book is a great idea for everyone even if they have a very successful electronic device. And one of our services at UCAD is we will let people come and print out pages and we'll make, we'll make the color pages and overlays for them if they want. They can even bring a flash drive that has their own digital photographs and we'll add those to the communication board for them. So anyone can get a free communication book, at least the pages, from UCAT. Also, the board maker software that we use to make this is available in our lending library, so any of you could borrow it for 30 days and help a client make a communication book. So now I'm going to go to the lowest level of an electronic communication device, and that's a single message unit. This one is a Big Mac. It's also made by AbleNet. There are several companies that make similar products, so we encourage people to shop around a little bit. Attainment makes one. Um, I, know, I know there's several others that also, also make single message devices. The, the Big Mac is about $129. So it's fairly expensive, but the nice thing about it, this one is easy to use and it's really durable. We've been using these for years and years. You can record and put any message that you want on there. So, um, what I've done, I just pre-recorded a message. I am really hungry. Uh, I could turn the volume up a little bit. I am really hungry. So, but we could change that. So with just I a am little. Really hungry. 
little piece of Velcro we could put on a new picture. Maybe we got a picture of a ball. So if I, if I had Velcro on the back of this ball, I could just stick that on there and then on the fly make the change to my message. I want to play with the ball. I want to play with the ball. It's very easy and quick to change those messages so that you can use the same device in a lot of different situations or environments. Then the, the next one is a very similar device, but this one allows you to record a sequence of messages. And what I've done on this one is just uh, recorded a birthday invitation so that a young man could go over to his neighbor's house and invite his neighbor to his birthday party. So I'll turn this one on. Okay, then that's, that's the end of that sequence. But you could put any sequence. And one of the ways that we're seeing these used a lot uh, in the school settings is where a teacher might record on there the things that a student did during that day in school. So the child could take it home and play, uh, you know, five or six quick messages so the mom could get a report of what Johnny did at school today. And I think I'm going to transfer the mic over to Scott and let him Take it from here. Okay, so the, the, message, the items that Craig showed you are pretty much um, all one message or one, one selection. So what it's missing is choice making. Um, make sense? And really, if you're going to be independent, you know, making, that, making choices is very important. So if I can get this up and going right, hopefully you'll be able to see everything that I'm pointing at. And we'll still pass items around. So this is a really, really basic choice-making option. And so I've only got two choices. And, and one of the ni so nice thing is we've only got two choices. Um, but, you know, if we turn it on, which is always important, We've got. I would like some grape juice. I want to play with the paper clip. Everybody hear that? So, I'd like some grape juice. I would like some grape juice. Or I would like to play with the paper clip. I want to play with the paper clip. So one of the things we're actually looking for with this is that it kind of an avoidant behavior. So that way we can see the choices are actually being made. As if I've got, I like grape juice and I like apple juice and I love both of them, where is the choice? Make sense? So by putting something in there, you know, we can have, I want to stand in the corner, I want to play with the paper clip, I want to sit and be bored for a certain period of time, and we're able to follow through with, with those choices, um, then we can see that there's some learning going on. Let me see. So this one is just really basic making choices. One of the problems with this device um, is it's limited to two items. So if I spent, what is it, $130 on this one, um, and I want to say three things, I just outgrew it. It's faster than, you know, my kids outgrow their pants. This one is called the Communication Builder, and I've got two choices on here again. I've got... And I'll tip it a little bit, you know, let me make sure it's turned on. Always important when you're demonstrating technology. I would like to play with the ball. So I want to play with the ball. Oh boy, let's read a book. And in here I've just got two rewarding choices. It's kind of an error-free learning. And actually the, the previous one that I showed is probably a little bit more advanced. But, you know, we're working on understanding that when I make choices, I'm going to get something. When I, when I make this sounds, when I make this, you know, when I make a selection. I would like to play with the ball. And hopefully we've got a ball that we can reinforce that with really quickly. Or. Oh boy, let's read a book. Okay, we're going to read a book. You know, just grab, you know, something that's going to be enjoyable for them, something short. But you don't read the whole thing. Because, that, you know, as many trials as possible 
is very important. You, play, you throw the ball once or twice, you're done. You read you know, a couple lines out of the book, you're done. You go back to making a choice. One nice thing about this one, though, is this one actually starts out with just one message, even, if, if that's where we're going. And then we can change it. And Craig's already showed you my other overlays. So I've got an overlay here that'll fit four things. So now, I've got... Let's play with the ball. Will you read me a book? I want to play with the doggy. I want that. I've got four different messages. The other thing that changed here, conceptually a picture of a book, pretty easy. Conceptually a picture of a ball or a dog, pretty easy. Drawing a picture of I want something, that's hard. If anybody can come up with a better one than this, I want to know about it. As you'll see that through, you know, in a lot of these different devices, they've got these abstract subjects that we talk about all the time. Verbs are pretty easy to draw. You draw some, you know, some verbs, action verbs, are pretty easy to draw. You know, nouns, places, people, things, pretty easy to draw. How about the concept of above? over, through, around. It's a little bit harder. And so if we're working, if somebody's working on picture-based communication, that's going to take a little bit longer for them to be able to understand the concept of. So on here I've even got I want a book I don't like onions. So we can make those choices and now we can start, be, start chunking our sentences together. But, you know, really easy, simple device. It's good to adapt. It's also got a nice handle. It weighs, it's pretty light. So this is, for somebody who's moving around, this may be a good option for them. Other nice thing about this one, it's really easy to record. So for my mustard message right now, it's mustard. And if I want to change that, all I've got to do is press the red record button, press the button I'm going to record into, and speak into the microphone. So we can make it Dijon mustard. And we've got that. We've made that change. Um, this one, this is the 32 message communicator, and we just stepped from 16 to 32 messages. This is actually probably actually one of my favorites. Um, this one's, you know, again, like that one, there's not, there's not gonna, I just, I brought this one because it's my favorite. 32 messages, six levels, so it's 192 different things to say. Um, nice and static. Um, it's actually this, you know, it may be cheaper than the communication builder right now, but I think it's 290, depending on. What's that one called? It's just called a communication. It's a 32 message communicator. Anybody wa wonder why it's called a 32 message communicator? Ah, <laughs> oh, good job. 32 messages, and it's simple. On off volume, change the levels with a knob. We use. I like um, this legal sized. Um, file folders, hanging file folders, because they're nice and stiff. It makes it easier to get such a large piece of paper and I, my in there. So there's a, you know, so 192 things is a, is a lot of different messages. Again, you can start with two or four and grow with the device. Yeah, it's just a hanging file folder, legal sized. We trim it a little bit. We, it's cut in half, so we, it's good for two different pages. Notice we bring in digital pictures. They're AA batteries for the ones that we've shown so far are 9 volt batteries. So, and that's another good concern. Again, when we look at, you know, the support systems that the individual has, this is a lot less scary than others. Okay, Craig mentioned a core vocabulary. So, this is um, a Vanguard. Um, and Craig held it up like this. The Vanguard 1 was about three times as heavy. It probably weighed about 24 pounds. It was heavy. Um, nobody wanted to carry it. I don't care how big you are. But with this one, we've got a core vocabulary, which means my vocabulary is set up so through a button, whatever button selections I make, I'm going to get my words. So I don't have as many um, 
canned phrases. A lot of what I'm going to say comes out of um, what buttons I select. Another nice thing about this vocabulary is it doesn't, the screen doesn't change as much. Um, kind of the concept behind the, the call it Unity or MinSpeak, the vocabulary system. Um, for instance, if I show you a picture of a cup, what does it mean? It could mean cup. It could also mean drink. It could also mean thirsty. It could also be drinks, as in um, the different types of drinks, lemonade, pop, water that are available. Um, also, a nice thing about this one is the, pic the screen doesn't change nearly as much. The navigation in something like this is actually easier than in a, in a screen that I've got to you know, I go here and everything's going to change, and then I go here and everything's going to change, and everything, then I go here and everything's going to change. Um, so the pictures are worth, are worth more. For instance, the symbol, the symbol of the sun right here. Um, it can be associated with good feelings, like I like something. Um, so for instance, I... I like. I like. But and once I know I like, I also know you like. I like you like. And he likes. He likes. And we can go from there. Um, I'm just pressing the clear button over. And if I add this not button, which is the kind of the inverse of whatever, for I not like is I don't like. I don't like. So, the, that, so by learning that vocabulary, there's more time spent maybe learning the vocabulary, but there's less time actually programming. That doesn't mean all your vocabulary is going to be in here, but a good chunk of it is, and a lot of it makes sense. Um, interjections, for example, those are the words that pop out. Ha, ha, ha. You know, hello. It's a, it's a phrase all on its own. And that and those live under the fireworks. So if I touch here, I've got different things, so um, ouch, you know, the hammer kind of makes sense. Um, there and there's well, um, there, touching there, um, and touching our food, it's yum. How to make sense also with our bridge, um, it's those prepositions, things you can do to a bridge. So the picture links into, um, into the words that are associated with it. So the bridge, um, you know, you drive that nail into the board. So the bridge and the, and the nail is into. Again, we go back to our bridge, um, and we got without, we got inside, the snail goes inside its shell, the dog brings the food, the paper to somebody. Um, so those, the pictures are, are built to help you associate the words that you're looking for. There's not all the vocabulary that we're looking for, though, is in the device. So, um, but we can add that in. We're never going to find names. Um, so, for instance, we touch our action here and our action again, and that's going to be our shoe. Well, let's see. Well, um, we can associate different actions and different stories um, with kind of things about people. So I'm going to go in um, to my icon tutor and I'm going to type in Kevin. And Kevin is, and if we look, it's um, you and then do something and Kevin fishes. So I go to the fishing symbol. And so if we go you, the shoe, there's Kevin. Also, um, you know, and I can associate kind of my, my people with that. Craig, for instance, he hikes. So we've got you, we've got do something, and Craig hikes. So that's, you know, and it's not actually that hard to add anybody in there. We just go up to our, into our toolbox. Um, we're going to assign core keys. Um, actually, let me go back. Cancel. So we're going to edit the core and type the icon sequence that I want. So you 
and then do something. So there's Craig and Kevin, but these ones that are grayed out may meet up with somebody else. So if I know somebody um, who drives a, tr a truck, and that could be um, Ken. You know, he, he's got a nice truck. So I'm gonna select those and hit OK, and I've got those, and now I can say, well, what is it gonna do? And I can come in, spell my message out, and I want it to be Ken. Shift K E N. And OK. Actually, there's one, one thing I have to put after Ken. You always want to put a space after your message, or it'll run up against the next thing. So, OK. And OK. So, one last OK. Now I've got you, shoe, and the truck, and I got Ken. So it is really easy, actually, to um, edit that vocabulary to make it so we can get that vocabulary into the device that needs to be there. For instance, again, names will never be there. But that's kind of the, the vanguard. With the, just the canned phrases um, in a device, those are, you know, like um, my birth, you know, I am this old. That's going to change. The vocabulary is going to need updating on any device. It just has to do with the amount and looking at the support that they're going to have after they get in out of that environment. So if, if they've got that good support to start off with, and, but we know that it, you know, it's not eternal support, nothing is eternal support. But if we say we can give him this now and this support now, and then and let him, him or her be able to use it, when they transition out of that supported environment, they're still going to be able to use that vocabulary. And this is a vocabulary that's going to, it's 30, 20, 30 years old, I'm betting, this vocabulary system. It's got that much of a history behind it. And as they even update devices, what we're noticing is, I mean, that even though they change the devices and the box changes, the vocabulary system isn't changing. So we're getting a lot of devices. Um, and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of requests for iPads. So I thought we thought a little training on that would be really important. So if you open up your device, and if it, if it comes to this page, a page that looks like this, if you swipe going right to left across it, you're going to end up with something that looks similar to this. And then up in the top right hand, in the top left hand corner, you should have one that says AAC. And that's going to bring you into the augmented communication options that we've got loaded onto here. And notice there's more than Prolo Quotigo. And a lot of the times, and that's the most popular one, but that may not be the best choice for an individual. Um, is Prolo Quotigo, um, Tap Speak Sequence, the TS Sequence, and Touch Chat HD. To come into a communication system, and mine is going to look different from yours because I've customized mine a little bit, and that's one of the fun things of doing these trainings, um, to where we've got a basic dynamic display communication system where we can go into our basics and we can have it and we can say, Hi, and we can have, Good morning. I am. Put your name in there. So I am Scott. Notice we, you know, how do y'all, I took a picture of some people. That was y'all. Um, we got iconic based communication in here. We got whole phrases. We can also, you know, access a core vocabulary. So we can go into like, I want a drink. And here's all my drinks that they've put in here for me. So I can do a drink of water. Your name. Your name, I want a drink of water. <laughs> howdy. Yep, howdy. Who knows what greeting we want to have, right? And one of the nice things about this is it's easily um, changeable. It's easily updated. You know, we can go in. And we've got our questions, our canned questions in here. But I can easily go in if I hit my pencil, which is down at the bottom. I can add a message. So 
my, one of my favorite questions is, do you like, do you like pizza? And I can find a picture or a symbol of pizza. Here's my pizza. And then we can add it. And so that quickly, I've added do you like pizza? a message for do you like pizza without my punctuation. So it can be really easy. And for some reason, people aren't afraid of the iPad. It's popular. And another thing is, um, but for individuals, one thing that we're running into is insurance isn't funding a device because it's not a ded dedicated device at this time. So we're having to pursue alternative funding sources. Um, the other thing, you know, if we've got individuals um, who have other op interests besides communication, I can go like this, and then I can go like this, and I can see what's underneath here. And maybe go into that. Let me open up Keynote if I want to. Or here's you know, games. Ooh, let's see. That one looks fun. And that's an issue. Does that make sense why it can be an issue? Because if we're trying to work with acquiring communication skills and they're d playing Angry Birds, <laughs> there's not a lot of communication value in Angry Birds. There's laughing, there's fun, yeah. So, but if a device is a communication device, it's a communication device. And you know, we got a referral that Craig worked on yesterday where they want, were asking for an iPad, an iPad, and they sent the referral for communication and the kid comes in and starts talking to Craig. Walks in and starts talking to Craig. Questions? The question would be, why are you here again? <laughs> but we get it. Every school district with, an, with a UAC team has at least one iPad. Some of them, the UAC teams have purchased more. They've got at least two copies of Prolo Quota Go. But one of the services that we provide is we can provide training with, at the UAC team's request, we can provide training to school districts. So if tri I'm going to Sam Pete, um, Next week, on the 19th. So the UAC, pro, con, you know, the UAC project does provide us with some flexibility. And if you have some issues that need to be addressed, we can try and coordinate those so we can work with you and the school districts while we're on a trip. And that kind of saves the budget a lot. Some of the apps are free. And they're, um, a website I'd actually refer you to is um, there, the Utah Coalition for Education Techno Educational Technology, um, ucet.org, has a blog where they post, because um, sometimes people put their apps on sale for free, and if you, can, if you get on their blog, um, you can get email notifications of when apps become free. And even if I have no idea what the app is, it's free for a short period of time and I grab it. <laughs> and it, you just have to live in the state to subscribe to those emails. It's not like he has to do a lot of work. So even, if you're not in education. even if you're not in education, it doesn't matter. He'll put you on the list. Nathan Smith is, is a nice guy. So that's a great source for you know, getting free apps. You see the blog, it's actually a, their blog. It's UCET News, U-C-E-T-N-E-W-S, dot blogspot.com and I'm on there like every day just to make sure I don't miss out on free stuff and again I have no idea what half the stuff is but it's free and it's edu and I work in education so it's even educationally relevant and it you know, takes me five minutes to to get ten apps and as long as you know and then they go back to being two dollars and that's two dollars I didn't have to spend but there are, you know, other websites out there where they do reviews of, of different applications. There's um, Moms with Apps. There's um, Apps for Children with Special Needs, AFCSN.org. Um, 
And then there's autism at the center, which is really good. And they just do reviews and they rank them and things. Any other questions? Great. Thank you for letting me and Craig come. And give us a call if you've got any questions.